global warming is on the rise and we're on a tight race to find alternative energy sources. Solar, geothermal, and nuclear are all runner-ups, but is the solution actually all around us in the form of tiny creepy crawlies? While biomass is definitely an alternative, that is not what we're talking about today. Unfortunately, today's topic won't solve any pressing climate issues, but out of sake for interesting research, let's scale down from macro energy problems and dive deep into the world of microelectronic energy harvesting. In my previous video, I introduced and talked about cyborg beetles as an alternative to nano or micro air vehicles. The biggest reason why it's better to hybridize biology and robotics is because of how energy expensive a tiny drone is. Evolution has already created an organism that is incredibly efficient with its energy, so why try to build one from the scratch up and just augment what nature has provided? However, the issue of energy is still a problem. The beetles are equipped with a microprocessor, electrode, and for the real strong ones, a camera or maybe a thermal sensor. But they all require electricity to work. But that's no problem, right? Just add a battery and it's solved, but that's more of a band-aid than a real solution. Adding a battery just adds additional weight for the insect to carry, which could be used towards other important tools and is also limited in stored energy. The next step is for the beetle itself to provide energy for an unlimited source of power to use over its lifetime, and there's a couple of theories as to how, and they get more and more interesting and efficient. The first method comes from our familiar good friends at Berkeley, which seeks to use the free-floating sugars, trehalose and glucose, in the beetle's hemolymph, otherwise known as the blood of bugs. They used the same beetle for their cyborg trials and first needed to test how much glucose is actually available since that can vary depending on the species, stage of life, food source, time since eating, and activity level. To do this, they strapped up a beetle with electrodes into a gel and this machine to output this lovely graph. Huh. Don't worry, I have no idea what this means either. After spending countless hours learning electrochemical engineering and forgetting that I'm making this video, hence why it took so long to release, we can think of this as a single linear passage of time that this machine, the potentiostat, is sweeping. The line throughout the graph measures how glucose is being oxidized and reduced, and this first peak shows the point which the most glucose is oxidized in a second. It starts dropping off here because there's less glucose floating around now. Then there's a switch in voltage, hence why it turns around, and this dip that follows is all that oxidized glucose getting reduced back into the original glucose, hence why it starts and ends at around the same area. And if I'm wrong, then I return to the original paper and just trust this sentence. Just like cellular respiration, oxidizing glucose generates energy and this is achieved by implanting an enzymatic biofuel cell into the beetle. With that set up, they turned it on and measured the beetle generating a whole 15 microwatts, wow. which is nothing for us, but enough to kind of power the backpacks that control the beetles. Now, this strategy is pretty interesting, but it doesn't come without its flaws. First, this relies on the beetle having available glucose flowing in its body, and that can be quite inconsistent. Second, although the study did show that the beetle survived the operation and generated power for more than two weeks, it is sapping the beetle of energy and it could risk its mortality in real world practice. Thankfully, other speculative methods and theories try to scavenge energy externally and not directly from the beetle itself. One tried attaching a little solar panel to the back of a beetle and although that would work unfortunately it's too dependent on the ambient environment and would only work half of the day at most another peculiar method is to convert the difference of heat before and after their flight or with their internal temperature and external ambient temperature into electricity Kind of like how smart clothes that could charge our phone would work. What's incredible is that an electrical engineering lab at University of Michigan constructed a device that could theoretically be implanted into the pupa and the beetle will grow around it during metamorphosis. They tested with dummy chips and pipes and it turns out 95% of the operated pupa became an adult without problems. The energy scavenger device has been designed, constructed, and tested to be able to harvest around 10 microwatts, more or less depending on the temperature difference. Now, the final method we're talking about is what I consider to be the most interesting, and that is piezoelectric conversion. 
We'll look at this 2011 paper by Akdaka et al. and learn how they generate energy from a green June beetle merely by flapping its wings. Now, I threw out this big word earlier that I've never used or heard of before researching this topic, piezoelectricity. It's the electric charge that can accumulate in certain solid materials, and it works by that said materials such as crystals or even stuff like bones or DNA compressing or stretching. If we zoom into the molecular level, creates a magnetic field within the contorted molecule that isn't normally there, and that is what generates the electricity. It's a fascinating concept that's been used for many things such as electronic drums or cigarette lighters, and honestly, warrants a whole video that this channel doesn't exist for. But I digress. Now that we vaguely understand how piezoelectricity works, we need to figure out where's the best place to attach this material to generate the most electricity. Thankfully, this study has done just that. First, they tethered the beetle to a rod so it can fly in place, and then they made this small beam out of PZT, which is a piezoelectric material that has a high conversion efficiency, and placed it on different parts of the wings that shouldn't interfere with flight. But as one would expect, the most vibrations and consequentially the most power is at this point where the flight muscles are located. This point would theoretically output a whopping 57.6 microwatts per wing, but it's very difficult to harvest all of it. The study suggested two prototypes of how to attach this beam to the beetle to actually harvest energy, but it only generated 11.5 microwatts and 7.5 microwatts respectively. So... How am I gonna generate that kind of power? It can't be done, can it? Well, back to the drawing boards. What makes this a difficult venture is how limited the space is on the beetle's back. They need a design that has the right springiness and maximum active volume to generate the most power. Many brainstorming sessions later and they came up with this, a one-of-a-kind spiral that can be attached to the center of its thorax, and they quickly went to test it. Unfortunately, the study didn't get as far as testing the design on the June beetle itself, but they did measure with a fake beetle that stimulated its wings flapping and generated an impressive 22.5 microwatts per wing. Slightly better, but still much to improve to get to that mythical 57.6. There are so many ways to scavenge for energy and no right answer for it. If this video piqued your interest in this research, I highly recommend checking out the papers I've linked in the description and seek out other studies. And if you want more or other kinds of beetle vids, make sure to comment. I'm so grateful to each and everyone that's subscribed and commented so far, so thank you so much and stay tuned for more.